On May 15, 1957, Rita Steves received a phone call from the U.S. Air Force. The man on the line told her that they had extensively searched the Sierra Nevadas along her husband's flight plan and had found nothing. No plane wreckage, no signs of life. They were canceling the search and they were issuing a death certificate for her husband, David Steves. At the same time, David Steves was wrapped in a parachute in a small cave on the side of a mountain. He had no idea where he was, but he knew after six days of waiting and seeing no search and rescue planes that he couldn't stay there any longer. David Steves was from Connecticut and had strict religious parents. He was very rebellious in his teenage years. When he was 15, his parents sent him to a religious camp in upstate New York. However, instead of attending the camp, he hitchhiked to Alaska and worked on fishing boats all summer. When camp was finished, he hitchhiked back and told his parents not to send him to any more religious camps. He loved flying and began flying in his early teens. He was flying solo and got his pilot's license by age 16. All he wanted to do was fly. When he turned 18, he joined the Air Force, and he and his high school sweetheart, Rita, moved to Alabama where he was stationed at Craig Air Force Base. By 23, he was a lieutenant and flying a T-33 trainer, which was a two-seat version of the P-80. However, his rebellious attitude got him in trouble with his captain, and he was soon demoted to running shuttle trips between Mobile, Alabama and Hamilton Air Force Base in San Francisco. It was on one of these trips that disaster struck. On May 9, 1957, David Steves was flying his T-33 jet trainer from Hamilton Air Force Base in California to Craig Air Force Base in Alabama. He took off with no issues, and it was a perfect Southern California day. He wasn't expecting any harsh weather. It should be a completely uneventful, routine flight. The first leg of his flight was to take him from Hamilton Air Force Base to Luke Air Force Base near Phoenix. He left at 10.30 a.m., flew at 33,000 feet at a speed of 300 to 350 miles per hour. After approximately 30 minutes, there was a sudden explosion Smoke filled the cockpit, and David blacked out. When he regained consciousness, he was in a nosedive directly over the Sierra Nevada mountains. He immediately ejected, the canopy flew off, the seat fired out of the plane, and the parachute opened. He grabbed the reins of the parachute to control it, but it didn't feel right. He looked up at the parachute to see that the canopy had been burned. There were several holes in it, and he was descending very fast. As he grabbed the reins and tried to control the parachute, it felt like the canopy was going to tear more. All he could do was hold on and hope for the best. He makes impact near the peak of the mountain. Because of the speed of descent and the violence of impact, he sprained both ankles. He was now stranded at the top of a mountain somewhere in the Sierra Nevadas. All he had with him was a candy bar, a knife, a revolver, matches, and a parachute. He spent most of the first day trying to find a way down the mountain, but couldn't see any other way than straight down. As the sun was setting, he saw a cave lower on the mountainside about one mile below him. He dug his feet into the snow and slid down the mountain using his feet to slow and control his descent. He was able to slide down the mountain without incident, although it was extremely painful on his twisted ankles. He made it to a small cave where he was able to start a fire. He covered up in his parachute, ate his candy bar, and fell asleep. The next morning, he awoke to find both feet and ankles throbbing with pain and swollen. He couldn't walk, but he didn't plan to. He knew the Air Force would send out a search party, and he wasn't that far from Fresno. His plan was to stay put and let the search and rescue do their job and find him. When David didn't arrive at Luke Air Force Base, the Air Force sent plane after plane searching the mountains looking for him. They flew repeating his flight plan for days searching for him. After six days of extensively searching the mountains, they found no wreckage and no signs of life. They decided that there was no way that he had made it, and they issued a death certificate and called his wife, his brother, 
and his parents. David Steves was 23 years old and had officially died in an airplane crash. On the seventh day, David was still hunkered down in his small cave waiting for rescue with no food and melting snow for water. So seven days after his crash, after not seeing any search and rescue vehicles, he decided that he needed to venture out and find his own way out. So he gathered up all of his supplies and started heading down the mountain. As soon as he left, he felt as if he was being watched, but couldn't see anything. Over the course of his walk through this rugged terrain, he continued hearing noises and always felt like he was being watched and that something was following him. But this area was not unknown. There were trails and campsites for the summer months. But this was May, and everything was snow-covered, so he couldn't see any of the trails. Also, the campsites and trails didn't open for at least another month. He didn't know any of this, but he was in a popular area for camping and hiking, but no one would be there for at least another month. Though his ankles had partially healed over the first six days, walking was still extremely painful. He walked when he could and crawled when he couldn't walk. This lasted for 15 days as he made his way down the middle fork of the King's River. All he had to keep him warm was his parachute. He moved during the day and wrapped up in his parachute to keep him warm at night in freezing temperatures. After traveling for 15 days and 20 miles, he found an abandoned cabin which happened to be a ranger's station. He found an uninhabited ranger's station and broke into the cabin where he found canned ham and beans. He also found fish hooks and line. He devoured the ham and beans, then completely exhausted he laid down and slept for two days. When he awoke, he searched the ranger's station and found a topographical map on the wall indicating his location. However, what he saw on this map was extremely disheartening. All around him were high peaks and no civilization. He had been in the mountains now for two weeks, starving, seeing no planes looking for him, and he knew that at this point he would have to make it out on his own. But he was going to need his energy to get out. So he took the fish hooks and the line and went to a nearby lake and was able to catch fish. He had some food and shelter, so he decided to stay at the ranger station and try to regain his energy before attempting to hike out of the mountains. One day, as he was fishing, he again got the sense that something was watching him. He turned around and saw what has been stalking him for the last week. The mountain lion approached him as he backed away and headed back to the cabin. He decided that he wanted to get rid of the mountain lion, so he set a trap. He got some salt from the cabin and made a salt lick. He then took his revolver and rigged a trip line to fire the revolver when an animal licked the salt. He left the trap near where he had seen the mountain lion and went back to the cabin. A couple of days later, he was in the cabin when he heard the gunfire. He ran out to the trap to find that a deer had licked the salt and had been shot in the head by the gun. But there was a problem. The mountain lion had gotten there first and had claimed the deer. David needed this deer meat to survive and decided that this mountain lion wasn't going to stop him. He charged the beast, yelling, ready for a fight. This surprised and frightened the mountain lion and it ran away. David, starving, buried his face in the deer and began eating it raw. After eating all the raw meat that he could handle, he cut out the deer meat and dried it out to make jerky. He knew that this would keep and that he could take it on his long trip when he left the cabin. After spending a total of about three weeks at the cabin, he packed up the deer jerky and what was left of the canned ham and began his journey trekking through the valleys and over mile-high peaks of the Sierra Nevada mountains. When he left the safety of the cabin, he tried to cross the King's River. By now, it was too late in the season and the snow and ice was melting. The river was swollen and currents were fast. David was wearing his flight suit and had extra clothes and supplies that he had procured from the cabin, tied up around his neck. David entered the river and was immediately pulled under by the currents. He fought back to the bank and was lucky not to have drowned. In the meantime, he had lost the extra clothes and provisions. There was nothing he could do but continue on until day 54. 
He was sitting on a log, resting, in Cedar Grove, when a group of five, including a guide, strolled up on horses. When one of the women in the group saw him sitting there, she said, Hey, hon, how's it going? David was so shocked that he couldn't speak, and the party just strolled by. He called out to them, got them to stop, and told them his story. He stayed the night at the group's campsite, and the next day they took him to a payphone, where he called his mother. Then he called his wife, who had moved back to her hometown and enrolled in college to prepare for life raising their daughter alone. She couldn't believe that he was alive, and now a national celebrity. The U.S. Air Force took this opportunity at the height of the Cold War to promote this story of a true American. Every news outlet wanted the story, and he went on talk show after talk show as a man that survived a plane crash and 54 days struggling through the High Sierras. He also got a movie deal for his story worth $10,000, approximately $100,000 in today's money. However, not everything was as it seemed. Within a month, his wife had filed for divorce. While David was missing, his wife received a letter from a woman in San Francisco. It was David's mistress. While his wife was struggling to understand his death, she was also dealing with his cheating. Furthermore, a reporter interviewed David. There was a wildfire that started near where David had been lost. David had said that he did not start the fire, but after some pressure, he admitted that he had, in fact, started the fire. The reporters began to wonder, if he was lying about these things, what else was he lying about? After calling him a national hero, and now finding out about these lies, the media turned on him. This was the Cold War, and everyone was paranoid. To further support this, an Air Force captain didn't believe him, and released to the media that David was lying. The plane had not been found, they speculated that David had made up the entire story and had flown the plane to Mexico and sold it to the Russians. This plane was about 10 years old and had been used extensively in the Korean War. There wasn't anything on this plane that Russia would pay for. Furthermore, the rangers in the mountains confirmed his story. They were able to find his campsites and traces of his story at the rangers station and all along his route. So these allegations that David made up the story and flew the plane to Mexico could simply not be true. David immediately requested discharge from the army. In order to clear his name, he flew over the High Sierras for months, trying to find the wreckage to no avail. After not finding the wreckage, he moved to Idaho and flew experimental planes. In 1961, at 31 years old, he crashed an experimental plane and died. After his death in 1977, Boy Scouts camping in Cedar Grove on a hike found the wreckage from his plane. The Air Force finally admitted that David had been telling the truth and that he had been lost in the mountains for 54 days. They sent a letter of apology to his ex-wife, his brother, and his family. This is True Mysteries. If you enjoyed the story, please like, comment, and subscribe. Thanks for watching.